Oh, you're dining in Paris with a full belly of French onion soup and a mouthful of double chocolate souffle. (laughs) Okay, enough of that bad accent. The waiter approaches asking how your meal was, and mouth full, you give a satisfied expression and make the A-OK gesture. You expect to see happiness on the waiter's face, but he looks at you with irritation. Well, it turns out that making a circle with your index finger and thumb does not mean OK in certain countries. In France, it means zero or worthless. Instead of praising the delicious food, you called it worthless. Oops. In Venezuela, Turkey, and Brazil, it's a hand gesture you shouldn't use either. In these countries, this is a sign that will offend pretty much anyone you flash it at. Enough said. Just give them your biggest smile and wait till you finish what's in your mouth to give your proper thanks. All over the world, giving a thumbs up is seen as a positive thing. It's an expression of your liking towards something that everything is good. In parts of Italy, West Africa, Iran, and Greece, though, it carries a stigma as an incredibly offensive gesture. When visiting Malaysia, you use this digit to point at things. So next time you're trying to hitchhike in these countries, you should reconsider sticking your thumb out for a ride. You might never get picked up. Trying to order two of anything or showing someone the peace sign in the UK, Australia, or New Zealand is fine as long as you don't have your hand the wrong way. Do this gesture wrong, and you're giving a very offensive hand signal, which isn't going to win you many friends. So make sure that when you have your index and middle fingers pointed up in the V-shape, your palm is facing outwards, and you'll have a great time, mate! Bowing is used a lot in East Asian cultures to greet each other and guests. The deeper the bow is, the more respect you are being given. Fortunately, most Japanese don't expect foreigners to understand the bowing etiquette right away. They'll generally also accept a handshake or a nod. But being familiar and practicing your bowing etiquette before going to Japan will impress all the locals. How low can you go? Using your index fingers is considered impolite in several European, Latin American, and African nations. It's particularly rude in China, Japan, and Indonesia when pointing at a person. The gesture might be taken as you singling someone out to blame or insult them. If you ask for directions in the Philippines, you might be left scratching your head, wondering where they're pointing. Don't be alarmed. The locals use their lips instead of raising their hands. When in doubt, wherever you are in the world, just gesture toward a person or place using your entire hand. You might think that sticking your pinky finger out makes you look fancy. But in China, it's frowned upon. This gesture is the same as giving a thumbs down and meaning that something is making you unhappy. When taking photos with others, you want to be respectful and don't want to make any obscene hand gestures. Two gestures to avoid, in particular, are sticking up only your pinky finger and pointing at something with a dirty object, like a used fork or a chopstick. Now, it's fun to eat with chopsticks, but you might accidentally cause a fence if you put them down the wrong way. When you're in China, South Korea, or Japan, don't make the mistake of sticking your chopsticks upright in a bowl of rice. This is considered bad luck. If you have to put your chopsticks down, simply place them on the side or across the bowl instead. Likewise, when eating in South Korea or China, don't ask someone to pass you some food. In these countries, you have to join in the action and grab what food you desire. And you're not going to offend anyone if you take that last bite either. In some places, it's acceptable to blow your nose while at the dinner table. Not all of us are even prepared for the sudden trickle of the nose. But as long as you excuse yourself and turn away, everything is okay. Except if you're vacationing in Japan, China, or South Korea, where the chilies can make your nose runny very quickly. So never blow your nose in public. If you must clear your nostrils, consider leaving the table and blowing your nose in the restroom or hiding away from any other observers while being quiet. It's considered rude and unhygienic to the people around you. Always use a paper tissue, not a handkerchief, and throw it away after use. Fiji is one of the top destinations in the world. Beautiful beaches and friendly people. 
spending your vacation on this island, you're bound to meet a few local Fijians that'll want to shake your hand for a very long time. It's customary to hold your hand for the entire time that you're exchanging greetings, no matter how long. You should also make sure not to pull away too quickly. It's considered very rude if you end the handshake abruptly. If you are in India, you put your hands together instead of shaking a person's hand. Holding your hands in a prayer formation, tilt your head down slightly and greet the person with namaste, with your hands close to your chest. Crossing your arms means nothing in most countries. Maybe you're cold, bored, or it just feels more comfortable. In Finland, though, it's likely to send the wrong kind of message. Having your arms crossed means major disrespect. Finnish people see this as a sign of arrogance and defiance. It's done mainly to tell the people around you that you're looking for trouble. Yikes! This body language will be taken as a dare, so you're likely to be confronted if you do it. Specifically, avoid crossing your arms at people directly. You don't want to cause any trouble if you're over there on holiday. Let me continue my world tour, and now we're heading straight to Europe. Let's start our journey in Greece, a place with thousands of years of history. Even in modern days, there are still ancient ruins there that are being carefully preserved, and it's an interesting ride. The airport of Athens has a built-in museum with ancient artifacts. And here's how ancient and modern coexist there. Here's the view of the Acropolis from the street. A Spartan roaming the streets of Greece. A Redditor shared a photo of a modern building built right over the ancient ruins. The visitors can see the ruins through the glass. Greece is also very well known for its cats roaming the streets everywhere. This Redditor spotted a cat guarding the National Bank of Greece. These days, everyone is trying to reduce the usage of plastic. Some use paper straws and some go with glass straws. But this cafe in Greece offered to use macaroni as straws. I'm not sure if it's stupid or genius. Another user went to a restaurant in North Macedonia and got baffled when they served slices of pizza on waffles. Double win, a snack and no waste. In Romania, vending machines seem to be a thing. This one, for example, is a machine with ham. And here's a better one, a vending machine selling cartons of eggs. Scrambled eggs, probably. Europe is a place where old neighbors are modern, and this combination is mesmerizing. I'll show you. This Redditor shared a photo of a modern basketball court squeezed between 700-year-old walls in Croatia. And here's a photo from inside a grocery store. Look at these old columns! Modern problems require modern solutions. These traffic lights light up the ground so that people who store their phones could notice when the light changes. Italy is a work of art with thousands of years of history. I have quite a bunch of stuff for you from there. Some ruins date back thousands of years, and a lot of that gets preserved. A Redditor shared a photo of a lobby of a hotel that has a glass floor so that the ruins were visible. And these are the railing in an Airbnb. Even street signs are a work of art in Italy. Look at this one. Another Redditor shared even more designs. This Redditor showed a photo of a supermarket that is located in an old theater in Venice. Another user added one more photo of that supermarket. Since we're talking about supermarkets, apparently, pets are allowed there. There are even special carts to carry them. Cities are centuries old, and there are quite a few narrow streets, so post vehicles have to adjust to fit them. Here's one of them. Some cities have canals or are located on islands, so boats are a thing. This is a UPS boat at Murano Island. Europe is packed with countries. The city of Basel in Switzerland is located right on the border with France and Germany. So the airport has three exits. You can walk out of it to France, Germany, or Switzerland. Let's walk out in Germany. Look, there's a traffic light with a girl walking a camel. The reasons are a mystery to me because camels aren't really a German thing, but it's cute. Here's another unique streetlight featuring Karl Marx, a famous German philosopher. Back to baffling vending machines. In Germany, you can find vending machines with sausages. Hamburg is Germany's major port city. There's a river that connects it to the North Sea. 
No wonder there's a drive through McDonald's for a boat. Look at this design of mineral water that is being sold in the Swiss Alps. A Redditor brought a souvenir from France. These are baguette-shaped pens. Look at this narrow house in Spain. I wonder what it looks like inside, but unfortunately, the Redditor only shared the exterior. In Portugal, cell phone towers are disguised as trees. And this is a bus that can ride the roads and then turn into a boat. A Redditor spotted doors in London that have doorknobs in the center. This seems super inconvenient, but apparently the handle doesn't turn and exists only to pull the door closed. And the metal part with the keyhole has a little handle on the bottom of it. It's your first trip to Egypt, and your new friends there invited you for lunch. The food seems a bit dull, so you decide to spice it up with salt and pepper. You don't see it on the table, so you ask the host for it, and you notice everyone's shocked. It turns out, it's a huge insult to the cook when someone wants to change the original taste of the food on their plate. The cook made it that way for a reason, and wanting to spice it up means showing that the dish wasn't good enough. You're used to doing it as a kind gesture around the world, but don't tip waiters, taxi drivers, or hotel workers in Japan. They can get offended because they already get paid for providing you with good service. And there's no need for extra money to make it any better. If you really want to show appreciation, just say thank you. It's okay to tip private guides, tour companies, and interpreters. You can put any amount that feels right to you in an envelope and hand it down to them. If you want to impress your new Japanese friends or colleagues, take some time to study chopstick etiquette. When you master the art of holding chopsticks, Remember not to rub them together. People do it to remove splinters, so it might look like you're unhappy with the quality of the pair that your host provided you with. Don't put your chopsticks vertically in your bowl of rice. This way, it can be seen as an offering to the deceased. Don't wave chopsticks in the air or use them to point at things. Both are considered really rude. The same is with moving things with your chopsticks or the hand holding them. It looks disrespectful, plus you're likely to spill things. When in Italy, don't order a cappuccino afternoon. The locals don't do it because they believe the milk and foam turn this drink into a meal and it's not good for digestion. Also, be prepared to enjoy your coffee standing at the bar and pay for it before you even order it. First, you pay the cash register, then show the receipt to the server to get your drink. Are you a big fan of chewing gum? Well, you'll have an uneasy time in Singapore. Using, selling, and importing chewing gum is banned there, and you'd have to pay up to several thousands of dollars for doing it. This law was introduced in the 1990s to make the city cleaner and keep the local fast trains up to schedule. When they launched a new transit system, passengers stuck gum onto train door sensors, causing some serious delays. With the new rules, this problem was solved. The no gum policy, along with many other strict rules, did help to make Singapore a really clean and fine city. Pun intended. If you absolutely can't imagine your life without chewing, the local authorities recommend replacing the gum with bananas. When someone asks you to pass them something, like salt at the table in Bolivia, don't give it directly to them. Hand it to the person sitting next to them and they'll pass it for you. If the person next to you is asking for that little favor, you still can't hand it straight to them. The person next to you will have to help. This table etiquette comes from a superstition that handing something to someone directly into their hands brings bad luck. For the same reasons, you can't reach across the table or stand up to pass something or toss it to someone. And don't forget to keep both hands on the table when you aren't eating. It might look like you're trying to hide something if your hands aren't visible at all times. When you arrive for a meal in Jordan, the hosts may give you some bitter Arabic coffee as a warm welcome. Don't try to stretch it for the rest of the evening. The polite thing to do is empty it fast. Only when everyone's done with the drink do people go back to socializing. As you pass the empty cup to the hosts, make sure to jiggle your wrists. 
If you just pass it without jiggling, it will mean you're asking for a refill. Don't rush to arrive at an event on time in Venezuela. People might think that you're rude or greedy. The polite thing to do is to be 10 to 15 minutes late. Events scheduled for 7 o'clock will often begin at 8 o'clock or later. A popular story goes that in the 1980s, a foreign reporter arrived at a press event more than an hour late. When he saw the room was mostly empty, he went to apologize to the host for missing the event. The host then told him he was the first reporter to arrive. It's quite interesting because the clocks in this country have officially been 0.9 seconds ahead of the rest of the world for years. Ah yes, everyone loves a holiday. But figuring out what to pack in your luggage can be a daunting task, especially when you're limited on weight and baggage space. Not to mention you're likely to do some holiday shopping on your adventure away from home. So you're going to need extra space on your return for all those souvenirs you've collected. Accumulating too much weight or bulk can end up costing you a handsome fee with the airline if you're not properly prepared. But you can now relax. You just focus on booking your vacation. We'll take care of your luggage with these handy traveling tips. No doubt your clothes are going to take up the bulk of your luggage. Considering most airline standards permit one bag for most local trips and up to two bags for longer distances, that doesn't grant you a whole lot of space if you plan on being fashionable on your getaway, especially in the winter. However, this doesn't mean you have to turn your undergarments inside out for repeated use. The key here is to be clever with how you pack. Firstly, you might want to consider how you're folding your clothes. The most space-efficient method to store your wardrobe in a suitcase for travel is to roll up each item. Think of your clothes like those sleeping bags you used to take on your camping trips. They always seem too thick for their compacted covers, but with perseverance, you could roll it up tight enough to fit inside. Now, you don't need to wrestle with your clothes quite as much, but the same principle here applies. Start by folding your shirts, pants, and whatever else you plan on packing neatly, similar to how you might find them on a clothing store shelf. Then, when you have them in a relatively rectangular or squared off shape, roll them up tightly. Now that you have your little clothes logs, start packing them into your bag. And behold, extra space! Now, here's something we've all experienced arriving at our holiday destination. We drop our suitcase on the hotel bed, open it up, only to find all our clothes unfurled and scattered like a tornado stormed through our bag. Your luggage has had a rough journey from your home to your holiday destination. It's been dragged through airport terminals, tossed around by baggage handlers, and rocked back and forth during in-flight turbulence. A simple stationary item rubber bands will help you keep your clothes neat. Now that you've got them rolled up, place a couple of rubber bands around them to keep them from unfurling. This is an especially neat trick if you want to roll an outfit together as one. Maybe you've got head-to-toe denim that you can't wait to rock on your getaway. Fold up your clothes as before, then layer the different items of your ideal outfit atop each other. Roll them up as one, then use the rubber bands to keep them together. You can preemptively decide your day-to-day -day outfits before you even board the plane. However, you may still prefer to fold your clothes, especially business or formal shirts and pants. Lucky for you, we have a handy trick for that, too. Instead of folding each item individually, we're going to lay it out all on top of each other. Start with your shirts and tops, alternating with one on top and one on the bottom, keeping the necks of your shirts at the center. Work your way down to your pants and smaller items until they're all laid out flat. Try to keep your pants in the middle. Finally, start folding your items in on themselves, with the shirts creating the outer layer, until you end up with a neat bundle, like a present. You should be able to sit your bundle squarely into your bag. Want to save even more luggage space? Instead of putting your undergarments and socks into their own section, Try fitting them into available spaces and gaps within the rest of your luggage. If you plan on taking a cap with you, for instance, the inside of your headwear is a great space to store your socks. This applies to other small luggage items too, such as phone chargers and ties. Though keep in mind that you can also lay your ties and belts out flat across the clothes in your luggage to conserve space. And if you're really limited on baggage size, say all you have is a carry-on for a fortnight long trip, here's another method. Get yourself some compression bags to store your clothes in. 
These bags will compact multiple sets of clothes into the size of a small laptop bag. Fold up the clothes you intend to pack and store them into the compression bag. You should be able to fit 8 to 10 standard clothes items or a few bulky ones. Once you've filled the bag, seal it and squeeze the air out through the built-in one-way pressure valve. The easiest way to do this is either by rolling it, and you should be pretty good at rolling your clothes by now, or by using your knees to apply pressure. You should be able to fit two to four of these compression bags in your standard carry-on suitcase, which is especially helpful if you want to save money by avoiding checked-in luggage. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.